Hello and welcome to Dinish Guarda YouTube podcast series powered and in partnership with openbusinesscouncil.org and citiesabc.com. Once again, we are here to profile and uh, highlight the biggest personalities in the world, the people that are changing our society and actually creating better narratives. And I think more than ever, with all the advances of technology, I think we need really to have a feet on the ground and we need to as well to keep a narrative that actually keep us, um, I'll say, focused. I think one of the wonderful things about our civilization is the capacity of technology. But at the same time, the narratives that we have, I call it the operating systems of our cultures, are more important than ever. And this is important in terms of the traditional values of society and as well, uh, being an European, our Europe has been creating some of these values, especially for the last, uh, I would say, 4,000 years. Um, and I think uh, in the last uh, 1,000 years, there's a lot of changes, and especially the last 100 with the fourth industrial revolution, uh, we've been accelerating all these different things. And um, today we're going to be talking about someone that is precisely leading, uh, I would say, an interesting bridge between um, Europe and, and different parts of the world, but uh, uh, I welcome to our series, Poole Jensen, that is the Managing Director of the European Business and Technology Center, which is based in Delhi, in the headquarters. And I think being European business and being in India is already a fantastic bridge with two of the biggest civilizations, and as well, the I would say the most dynamic economy in the world, that is India, and of course, Europe, which is still a powerhouse, but going as well for a lot of changes. Um, the BTC is dedicated in generating new business opportunities and enabling transfer of technology between India and Europe within the fields of climate change, sustainability, and biodiversity in the sectors of energy, environment, mobility, and ICT. And um, uh, Will Jensen is, he has the main task to execute the mandate of bringing the European Union and India closer together which is a big task and I think more important than ever, I would say. And as well, looking at strategy, operational relationships. And this includes addressing all the challenges and transferring, first of all, the cultural challenges with the Indian culture, which is not one culture, it's 20 something cultures. And as well, the European, which is as well 20 something other cultures and putting this together, which I think it's really more important than ever, but as well providing developing clusters for clean energies, and of course, all the areas of collaboration in terms of research and development and innovation. And I think this is some of the areas, I'll, I'll touch this in the interview, we're talking about Smart Cities Knowledge and Innovation Program. We're talking about the PropA 2021 project, and then the MSCI uh, Export Support Partnership, which aims to increase the Central Baltic SME's export to Sub-Saharan Africa, India, and the UAE. And then I think let's go to the people first. For me, people are always first. So, Poole Jensen holds a Bachelor in International Trade from the Copenhagen Business School, where actually I was a teacher, so it's actually great to have a, a fellow um, a personality here, and a Master in Business Administration from Cas Business School in London. His career started uh, in the largest Danish conglomerate, uh, East Asiat Asiatic Company, shipping, transportation and distribution firm, and operating globally and else managing director global, global roles before he joined EBTC. Um, in terms of the work, and I think we're going to be talking that, uh, I think Paul well, uh, has quite a exciting capacity in looking at strategies as well in looking at how we can actually put different areas from transportation to logistics, and as well, special bridges between international uh, trade corridors and business developing in diverse areas. And I think this is more important than ever in a world that is more globalized, but as well full of geopolitical sensibilities. Um, and as well, I think our organization like the EBTC, which we're going to put all the links uh, for people listening to us, whatever channel you are, wherever you are in YouTube or uh, in Apple or, or Google or uh, even Spotify, we put all the information about the pool and about EBTC. So pool, uh, there's a lot of things, but welcome to our series, first of all. Thank you very much, Finis. Very pleased to be here. Now, the pleasure is all mine. I'm a huge fan of Europe, and I think Europe is more important than ever. But as well, India, I'm a huge fan of India. So, <clears throat> so being, a, I, I want to go through the basis because I always like to start with the basis. So, someone like you that is a citizen of the world, but as well as a, 
a Danish person. I'm sure that the Danish is very present and Danish is a beautiful country that I love uh, because I lived there for five years. And as well, where Hans Christian Andersen, of course, probably changed the world with his narrative. But, um, and as well, one of my favorite writers. But I would like to start, so from this cultural base of uh, Denmark uh, to the world, and as well about your background. I think I would like to start with that because I think for people listening to us, there are people all over the planet. And um, I think in the end of the day, it's about people first. Any business is about relationships. Any relationship is as about people. And uh, sometimes you forget that in the time of technology, in the time of tweets and, and actually even YouTubes and so forth. Yeah, indeed. Indeed, Dennis. Now, uh, so yes, I, I am a Danish national. Uh, whether you want to call me a Danish native is another question because... <laughs> Even even as a as, as a child, I I grew up with uh, um, uh, both parents were Danish, uh, but had the uh, opportunity and actually privilege already in those uh, years to uh, live for long periods of time in, in Canada, in Africa, in Indonesia, and uh, I really only came to Denmark um, in, uh, in in the eighth grade, and I also think that was the most forming time of of, of any person's life. Yeah, so eighth ninth grade, the gymnasium. Um, uh, in, in, in Denmark, and then I joined actually uh, as, um, as an apprentice at that company, the East Asiatic company, which has a model of uh, working during the day, studying at night. So my bachelor degree, I took uh, over four years uh, in, uh, uh, in the evening period, and after that, I was um, uh, transferred to, uh, to other parts of the world, to Australia, to, to New Zealand, uh, and, and Germany. So actually throughout my whole life, I've been, been traveling a lot. And the point I have been longest is actually India. I was with the East Asiatic company uh, for, for 10 years. And after that, uh, that's when I took the decision to resign from the company and then uh, go and do a, a full-time MBA because I had not studied on campus and had university life. So I wanted to also explore that. And then uh, give full attention to uh, to uh, the master of, of business administration in international business, and post that, I um, I um, uh, what do you call it? Graduated uh, right uh, in 2001 when uh, when um, uh, somebody flew into the uh, the World Trade Center in in, in New York, so uh, it was very difficult to to find find jobs in in, in London. I was uh, on the road with approximately 8,000 uh, newly minted uh, MBAs. Decided to move to Germany, join a consulting firm there in Germany. And that is the consulting firm that brought me to India because my task at that consulting firm was to internationalize a, a, a company that was focusing on a German speaking area uh, to, uh, to, to a larger market. And in 2001, what was the, the, the thing you do as a newly minted MBA was focus on BRICS. Yeah? It was Brazil, Russia, India, and China. That's what I did. And I ended up myself in, in India. And uh, I think what our discussion would also say, why have I stayed back since 2005 in India? Is simply, I mean, I, I like to say that uh, I cannot fall into a routine in India. There's no way you know what's gonna happen to you when you wake up in the morning. You have a plan, you have a calendar. I can be as organized and sorted as I want to be. The minute I hit the office, the day looks, uh, looks different. And, and you and I, we even, know that uh, because we had uh, planned for this interview uh, I think a few weeks back where it was just not possible because all of a sudden uh, I had to be in in a, in a, in a ministry now um, that doesn't mean I, I I don't feel Danish I feel more Danish probably here than I feel uh, if I were to live in in Denmark and I love Denmark just like you love Denmark I also uh, I love Denmark love to visit but I love just as much after three weeks uh, of Denmark or even Europe uh, I uh, my feet are scraping to come back to, to India to to uh, to to the chaos, the dy dynamism, the, the the action, because you have to have to understand. I was I was sent here by a company that said, okay, look, I, I know it's not part of your contract. You're not supposed to go to India. You have other plans, but just go for a year and set it up, get it done, and then come back, and then we'll uh, we'll follow your 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 contract. Yeah, and of course, and I think that's why. Uh, uh, that's also the discussion I have with many, many, many uh, European companies that are looking at India. I mean, there's, it's very, very certain that you get anything done in a year in India. You do have to have a long-term plan, a long-term vision. You might also need uh, some deeper pockets than you would immediately think. Um, so after a year and I had not achieved what I wanted to achieve and what I promised uh, to achieve, I uh, 
took the decision. I extended for another two years. I said, I want to make this happen and I need more time. I also needed more money. And then after two years, I really started, started enjoying it. Uh, uh, we started getting contracts and started becoming profitable, the business, and I extended another two years. Yeah, so I was five years with that, uh, that company before I then joined EBDC, uh, which was a bit more of a, uh, what do you call it, uh, uh, a coincidence that somebody approached me and said, hey, what about something like EBDC? Would you be interested in that? Because that's all about clean technology, climate change, sustainability. And I said, yeah, that could actually be interesting. Uh, but I don't know what it is you're looking for me in my background because I have no uh, uh, technical, technocratic, bureaucratic, diplomatic, political background because EBDC at that time was a project. And it was a project that was set up by the EU and India, something they agreed upon in 2008 at an EU-India summit. Um, and uh, what I was told was that the skills they required were to build up a company, build up a team that could do exactly what you're saying, be that bridge between EU and India in the clean tech space at a business level and at a technology level. Yeah, so that's uh, uh, how, how, how I ended up in India. And uh, yeah, that was, uh, uh, I joined India, EBDC in um, 2010, that's 12 years ago. And since then, EBDC has also been under immense transformation and, and evolution. And Denise, I cannot, uh, say heavily enough or reiterate hard enough that right now is the time where I feel in all those years that uh, we're at the right place at the right time. I, I, I know there's a lot going on in the world. You mentioned uh, geopolitical imbalances and, and, and uh, uh, evolution and, uh, and drama. Um, so I know in Europe, we tend to say, oh my God, this is... Um, uh, this looks bad, this is, uh, we have to be careful and how do we deal with this? And, uh, uh, but in India, my sense is that the feeling is that it's getting interpreted in a positive manner by way of saying, hey, here's opportunity. And I see it as my role, as my task today to convey that opportunity to Europe and say, yes, it's challenging times, but challenges also brings about opportunity. So have a look at India and uh, uh, maybe we can help you show uh, the way to India, uh, how you can uh, get a foothold in India and maybe even also be successful in India. That's, that's amazing. And, and I want to touch uh, EBTC more. Um, that is the purpose as well of this interview. But before that, let me ask you a couple of questions. So yeah. the devil is on details. So one of the challenge for people doing business, especially, and I think your background is amazing because of course, being Danish, but as well grew up in Canada, um, working in multiple places around the world makes you a very special person that is prepared for a lot of different cultural backgrounds and actually changing because, of course, if you are in Denmark and Canada, it's completely different. And, of course, if you go to German, you have as well the German principle. Of course, India, like you said, even India, if you are in New Delhi, is completely different from oh, Mumbai yeah. and so forth. So from this experience... And I think for people listening to us, because I think this is one of the biggest challenge precisely in geopolitics, like people tend to see the world on their eyes, on their frames. Um, and I think that I always like to highlight the cultural nuances because for me, my success has been trying to understand cultures. And I think the fact that I'm building as well a global footprint, both with this podcast, but as well with my businesses because of that, I like to listen to culture and I love different cultures, but a lot of people don't. And especially if you are American, if you are yeah. Russian, or if you are Russian right now, it's probably my not potato. But if you go to some of these things, you have a lot of different constrangements because of your own cultural background. So I would like to touch this because I know that you have to change this since a child. You have whatever you wanted or not, when you start going and being confronted to different cultures, you have to see, okay, how do I keep my identity? And I adapt to others' identities. So I would like to touch, how did you personally adapt towards that before you go to your achievements in career and as well EBTC? Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, so what I have learned from, from birth basically is uh, having to be open to to different people, people who are different from, from myself and my, my background, yeah? So I also had to, to learn that when I visited my grandparents in Denmark from, from, from Canada, and I was just a kid, I, I had to see why are they doing this? Why, how come are they different? That's not what we do uh, at home, mom, yeah? And uh, they would have to explain, yeah, this is, how, this is how it is, people are different. And because we were traveling everywhere, and it, you know, it's so in your face when you travel as a child, and we went to um, 
uh, uh, I, I was schooled in, in, in Africa, in Burundi, in Bujumbura. Yeah, and obviously people look very different there. And, and, and I also saw poverty for the first time. Yeah, and this is at, at, a, at, a, at, a, at a young age. I had a lot of questions about that. And those questions were, were answered and, and, and we had conversations about that. Yeah, and the same in, in Indonesia. I could not understand why would, would uh, people spit on my mother uh, if she didn't give them uh, uh, any, 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 any money when they were begging. Yeah, so, uh, and going to school, you know, jumping from school to school and new classes and, and new classmates all the time just forced me and my brother to be open and, 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 and to engage. And, and uh, uh, thankfully, some of the schools were also international schools. So there was a lot of international, uh, international people. But I think that's, that's one thing that that has, has brought about, uh, this openness and understanding. So really an empathy. So I, I spend a lot of time when engaging with people in trying to understand why is he saying this? Especially if I say, uh, I don't understand. What, what, this, this is so... I still have the trait of North uh, uh, North Europeans. Yeah, I'm still, I'm still Scandinavian. Yeah, so I would like to have everything on the table so everybody knows what we're discussing. Everything's clear. Everything's transparent. Yeah, but my counterpart might not think that. He says, "Who is stupid and put everything on the table?" Obviously, we'll have an ace or two up my sleeve. Um, so you need to uh, understand that. And having empathy, I think, uh, brings you a long way in a lot of uh, uh, discussions and a lot of negotiations, and especially when I'm in a job that is all about stakeholder management, managing a lot of different stakeholders, their expectations, their wants, their needs, their requirements, and knowing who are they reporting to, what do they have to report and how are they measured or whatever. So this, this whole uh, growing up in this way has, has, has given me the, I would say the capability of of, uh, of, of uh, understanding uh, other people's backgrounds or at least thinking before I judge. It, it's really, I would say this is the most important thing and most difficult thing of our times because of course everyone right now is starting to travel in some ways, but actually still the people that really travel like us is like 1% of the global population. Yeah. So we are not actually uh, representatives of the rest of the world. Oh. And I think this kind of, uh, cultural shocks that you you checked and as well made you of course a citizen of the world prepared for a lot of different things so let's go right now um my, my first questions before going to vtc is okay how do how europe is positioned itself because one thing that definitely is happening is that europe is disappearing okay and i'm i'm going to be direct on this one i know that as a dentist you, you like this but for instance my experience with africa my experience with latin and i'm an european and I'm, of course i'm in the uk where we had recently Brexit, um, and I'm Portuguese, a bit French, and now living in the UK with actually a, a, a wife that is not European, so so I at least uh, uh, direct with European. So it's kind of a challenge that I've been facing as well on my own, but definitely the Europe um, role of leadership is disappearing in the world, whatever, uh, although I don't want that to happen, is happening, okay? And, and this kind of a challenge that, because uh, if you go to Africa, uh, people, even former colonies of uh, of Europe, they kind of have uh, less and less relationship. And Europe, uh, as well as a as a kind of a cultural um, embassy, <clears throat> and as well as a political, or as well as a, especially business, of course, is a powerhouse. And there's a lot of fantastic things in Europe. I'm not criticizing. I'm just saying that there's a challenge right now on that level. Yeah. And as well, for of course, you are in India which right now, of course, is becoming is right now the fifth economy in the planet. And I think about 2050 might become the second economy passing the United States and only after uh, China. And you never know because China population is getting very old. So things can go in a lot of different directions. But how do you see this? First of all, Europe, because I think, of course, in an European organization, and you're going to touch that, it's more important than ever. And as well, I know that Denmark is a very strong European and I am as well, but I think the values of Europe are most important than ever, than ever, but this dimension it's it's a critical one. Yeah, I I agree, and I'm also saddened to see this evolution, which I'm also detecting that you mentioned that 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 Europe as as, as a leader on the global stage, I mean, there's an opportunity now to step up to the plate. Yeah, and but it it, it needs uh, cohesion, it needs uh, uh, collaboration among all the member states, and and what I'm unfortunately seeing. Uh, instead is 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 uh, a different uh, movement a, a different direction yeah and uh, that's really 
really a shame because I too think that with the European values, the current European values, uh, it would be good if Europe had a bit more of a, a, a leader uh, leadership action. Yeah, um, there are uh, several initiatives uh, I would say that 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 go in the right direction, and and some of them also pertain to India. So having the connectivity partnership with India, having the strategic roadmap with India, uh, even thinking Indo Pacific and and working strategically with India in 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 a corridor, sort of trying to create a a, a geopolitical balance to what else is there. Um, but yeah, I've, I've actually sensed this uh, also at a, at, a, at, a, at, a, at a business level, um, uh, Denise, somehow, um, because sometimes the time spent in Denmark, I've also obviously spent a lot of time discussing with, with peers and even family uh, uh, about, uh, about India. And, and um, you know, they're saying, oh my God, you work so much and uh, uh, you are always busy and, and, and don't get stressed out and, and what have you. And I'm talking to people who, you know, are fighting for, for 33, 35 hour work weeks, yeah? And, and I'm saying, look guys, if, if you don't uh, pick up the ant, I mean, you're somehow, I'm worried that many Europeans have become complacent and taken for granted a lot of things that have been built up by hard work uh, by, by previous generations and are then being overtaken uh, by other aspirational uh, and emerging economies. Yeah, So that's sort of been my, my argument when I've been talking to, to, to family and, and, and peers back, back home. Yeah, And I know it's it, it's great to to uh, to uh, to take the day off uh, at, at two p.m. on on Friday and, and and then go to the park and go to the beach or go roller skating and what have you. Um, uh, but yeah, at, at the end of the day, you still need to be very productive. You still need to be very active to be ahead of the game. Yeah, and I think ahead of the game does not mean to to bunker down and 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 create a lot of of uh, of, of best practice solutions in an ivory tower. It means to collaborate uh, across the board. It means to collaborate also with with other 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 markets. Yeah, and I think if there was more of such collaboration, you would also understand the need to work and think uh, differently. And I think that's that's uh, that's important. But yeah, it uh, still uh, worries me that uh, that uh, uh, Europe needs to to step up to the plate uh, to take uh, take a bigger leadership role in in, in this world. Yeah, you touch a very important thing, the nine to five um, kind of lifestyle, let's put it that way, that doesn't exist <laughs> any place outside of, with the exception of Europe. But in Europe, it takes it for granted and it's really a big challenge. I have that challenge as well in my team because people, yeah. if I, for instance, my part of the team in Asia thinks, okay, this is ridiculous. Uh, and of course, it creates a huge amount of uh, cultural clashes. But as well, of course, there's fantastic things in Europe. So let's go to BTC. And of course, this in itself is another podcast. Um, but definitely, I want to touch that more. But uh, I actually had a previous interview where actually we discussed that uh, actually with a serial entrepreneur as well. And yeah. actually, he's actually uh, in leading a billion dollars company that is just uh, highlighting his brand. And, and he said something quite interesting is that really there's people, their framework is nine to five and people that are allowed outside the box like us. And of course, we cannot judge them, but at the same time, we need to create awareness for that because it's a big challenge. Exactly. And of course, going to India definitely is a completely different ball game. So, tell us about. Uh, of course, I summarize what is EBTC, but I always get from the source for people listening to us. And I think it's a fantastic organization, um, especially first of all, like I mentioned before, because it's more important than ever because that's fantastic research on developing in Europe. India is becoming right now passing everything. But still, these bridges is where it makes the world economy a better place. And India, of course, is the biggest democracy in the planet, is the biggest population in the planet. It has so much uh, amazing things, but Europe as well. So I think is if we get this balance, we can actually create a lot of, and you mentioned, the opportunities are bigger than ever, because in the end of the day, when there's a hiatus of leadership is where the good leaders have to come. So pass the word to you. What is EBTC? Why it matters? And where people can find the information and how it works? Yeah, so um, EBDC was uh, originally, uh, what do you call it, created to uh, be that platform that connects at a business and a technology level. I said that before. So that means creating awareness about uh, the opportunity in India, what's there in uh, Europe to meet that opportunity. And, uh, you know, having been focusing, you know, been initiated by the EU and, and, and India, uh, there was a clear mandate that 
uh, EBDC had to be complementary to what the European individual member states were doing in India. It was not there to replicate, duplicate, crowd out uh, what was already being done. And what EBDC ended up uh, uh, doing and focusing on to be uh, uh, very complementary was at an early uh, time already to have a very clear focus on sustainability, clean technology and innovation. Um, was to focus on the demand side. Now, if you think about what the European individual member states, uh, to the greatest extent, that is very uh, supply oriented. So it all falls under the bracket of, uh, you know, one large bracket, bucket bracket that's called a trade promotion. Yeah. So uh, um, uh, say if I was the Danish ambassador, I, I'm a Danish minister, whatever, I'm obviously coming to India and I'm saying Denmark has good products, Denmark has good solutions, technologies, governance, and, and, and what have you. Now, uh, so do the Germans, so do the French, so do the Italians, so do the Latvians, so does everybody in the EU uh, when they engage with, uh, with, with India. Now, where EBDC can support is by looking at the demand side. So really, that's also why our head office is in India. That's also why the substance of our team is in India. It's because we spend a lot of time working with promoters of projects, with state governments, identifying projects that I need and in you know seeking uh, uh, solutions, partners, uh, and and you will be amazed how. Uh, Europe has a brand in India, yeah? so uh, they would like to team up with European counterparts, European financing institutes, European technologies. Yeah? But, so if we can support as EBDC to define that demand, define that project, structure the project and say, this is the way you can attract uh, European businesses, because we know what European businesses have in terms of challenges in coming to India, what European IP has a challenge, European technologies, um, and then maybe even structured in a way that could uh, um, attract European finance, because there's a lot of uh, finance out there, whether it's from the multilateral uh, banks, uh, the, the public national banks, whether it's from private banks, whether it's from venture capitalists uh, that, is, that are looking for good projects, sometimes impactful projects. So if we structured in that way as well, uh, then uh, we see ourselves as as, uh, as that good bridge in, uh, in bringing people here. So it's one, it's creating awareness about what's there. So what, is, what are the opportunities in India? What's the technology and solutions in Europe? It's about creating knowledge. So we have a, a variety of programs and, and, and forums to do that. So people can actually dive in and, and understand bits and pieces about it themselves. And it's about setting up programs and, and, and um, uh, uh, platforms to make companies and technologies meet those opportunities in, in, in India. So that's very, very short what, what, uh, what EBDC is about. And we have a great number of, of, of tools uh, to make this happen. Uh, we have an enormous amount of, of, of experts and access to an even wider pool of experts if, uh, if some of the uh, projects are very, very specific. Um, so, so, so in totality, uh, that is what it's all about. And I also spend a lot of time, uh, Denis, uh, talking to uh, European companies who do have great technologies, do have great solutions, and do a lot of research and development, and tell them, hey, look, um, why don't you come to India, uh, work with Indians, and then together create something for the Indian market, because the probability of having something that is attractive to Indian market at a price point that's also attractive to the Indian market. It's much higher if you do that. And we have plenty of examples of that, that happening. And what you're actually doing then is you're actually co-creating in India solutions, not only for the Indian market, but potentially also for a much larger market uh, like Africa and, and other parts of, uh, of uh, South, uh, South uh, East Asia. Um, so I, I know that's a, that's a tricky proposition for, for many companies to, to have a setup and have a structure to do so, but the reward is, uh, is, is uh, disproportionately high, and especially uh, in, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in a world that looks like it, like it does, uh, does today. So that, those are basically the advantages for businesses to, to look at a, at a closer EU-India relationship, if you will, dovetailing what the EU and India are doing at a, at a strategic and a, and a government uh, to government level. So let's say I'm a company from the UK and I want to do business in India. Um, can I go to EBTC um, or it's just uh, 
you have to be invited. So let's look at the practical oh, side of yeah. this, because I think it's a very important thing that a lot of people are asking and probably it's something that you want to highlight as well. Exactly. So you can definitely come to EBTC. Now, there's a lot of services. We're not uh, what you would term as a, as a, as an, uh, as a market entry consultant. Yeah, there's, there are many market entry consultants who do a lot of good work. There are a lot of services that EBTC would not do. We would not do a, a, a market research report. We would not want to incorporate a company for you. We would not want to do your accounting. Uh, all, all services that you would want to do if you're looking at India as, as a market. Um, but we have a great network of, uh, of uh, companies who will uh, engage in, in, in those sort of services. What we would do, however, is put you as a business, uh, uh, offer you, uh, say, a program so you get to understand uh, India. Uh, also, uh, try and understand, are you ready for India? We even have on our website something called the India Readiness a kit where you in a, in a quick questionnaire can understand, okay, uh, uh, you know, very high level finances, uh, resources, human resources, you know, are, are you ready uh, for, for India? And, and also explain that, that India, you know, technically for you from the UK, um, India is not only a country, it's, it's, a, it's a subcontinent. You mentioned, uh, alluded to it earlier, India has 20 different, even, even more different cultures than, than 20, the 20 you manage. Uh, so, and it takes me three hours, three and a half hours to go by flight from north to south. Yeah. So it just goes to show how big India is and people also think differently. People act differently and have different cultures. And that's also very, very important to know. Yeah. So, um, so different programs, you can look at our, our fora, be part of some of these, uh, uh, uh sessions that are there, uh, really uh, creating that body of knowledge, but also access that body of knowledge. And what businesses really want is, okay, I want business. Yeah. One, I want to know, okay, what is India like? Uh, how do I go about things? You know, what might be a good strategy? But I really want access to business. And that's what we also do uh, via a variety of, of initiatives. One uh, is, is, for instance, we call it clusters, but it's not really a class. It's more a consultation group where we get a lot of stakeholders from a given value chain. So if you say, you uh, are within the e-mobility. I'm UK. I have this component in an e-mobility uh, world. Um, I've heard uh, that India is super interesting and uh, e-mobility is the way forward. Can you help me in e-mobility? We would say, yes, we have an e-mobility cluster where we have already 12 or 13 stakeholders around the table. And they're all ideating and creating projects for themselves or going together bidding for projects that are being put on the market by private uh, promoters or public sector undertakings or by uh, 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 cities, which we also always, always monitor. But the interesting part is that you're sitting around a table with people that you know, if you're only a component producer within a whole value chain, that you know you will have to work with. So let's say you uh, make a, a, a great, uh, what do you call it, um, e-mobility, e-charging solutions uh, on an app. Yeah. Then sit around the table with other people who do the same thing, battery uh, producers, uh, car manufacturers, um, uh, promoters who want uh, e-mobility in, say, a, a sector. Um, and then you together ideate, okay, what is all needed? What do we, what do we want to do? And, and who wants to be part of this, uh, this product? So in that case, EBDC becomes the neutral convener of a lot of stakeholders, helps conceptualize projects um, and, and, and manages everybody's expectations and, uh, and handholds throughout the project implementation. And that can be done in, 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 in many, or is being done in, uh, in many different sectors. So the initiation of these clusters can, can uh, be uh, multi-prone. It can be from EBTC. We identify, say, hey, there's a great idea, great opportunities. Let's go and talk to some companies that say, uh, um, we want to establish this. Do you want to be part of it? It can be from a company itself that says, I have a great idea. I want to do this. I know I need to work with five other people. Can we create such a cluster, such a consultation group? Um, and you be the neutral convener because there's also uh, a clear um, knowledge that sometimes, say, you have a bigger company, uh, nobody wants to be told by a bigger company, this is what you have to do, and this is uh, my thing, and what have you. So, Happy BDC is the neutral convener, be project based, be demand focused. And, uh, and, and help structure the, 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 the whole project. So that's, uh, that's what we can do for, uh, for, for UK, UK uh, company as well coming, yeah? 
Oh, that's impressive. And I think for people listening to us, I think this is one of the things that me as an entrepreneur, I think is the most important thing for all of us as entrepreneurs, uh, as a business person, but as well as a thought leader, this is critical. And I think for us, one of the reasons I've been creating this channel is precisely to connect people, learn with people like you, Paul. And I think the challenge is really understand these nuances and have the opportunity to work with organizations like yours because it's a privilege, but as well as a great advantage because they exist and they are here to help us. So I think you touched the most important thing. So let's go right now to the program. So like I mentioned before, at the moment, you guys uh, have a huge mandate, especially in the areas of clean um, energies as well, research and development and innovation. But uh, let's look at the areas where you guys are really breaking um, and creating fantastic uh, um, breakthroughs. Yeah, I mean, I wanted to mention that uh, also also earlier. Um, uh, one very, very interesting initiative we are doing, which will uh, end up having a lot of impact, um, and that's also in the smart city space, actually, is um, the concept of living labs. Yeah, so one big challenge that companies have when they come to India with a great technology, great solution, is to make it work in an Indian scenario, make it work under Indian conditions. And uh, the long-term goal of these living labs right now is, is that we get at this test bed for European companies to be able to do so on a living population. What, we, what we've been able to do is, is we've been running a lab for two and a half, three years now uh, on a university campus in Hyderabad, the triple IT uh, Hyderabad University campus. And what we're doing is we're working in collaboration with the Hyderabad uh, municipality who says, um, we have a few very important areas, uh, uh, some, some areas that are important to us. One is security, uh, one is water, uh, one is waste, uh, and a few other areas. And then we run challenges for the city and then invite uh, entrepreneurs, uh, small and medium-sized enterprises, inventors to come and test the technologies and solutions on a living population and then uh, the Hyderabad uh, municipality can have a look at what has been tested and say, I think this matches uh, best our needs with the outcome that we are looking for. And then there's an opportunity for these companies to actually scale up the solution at city level. Yeah, so from a living population and a university, then to a, to a city level. And the next phase of this lab is going to be to offer those services uh, to, uh, to, to, to European companies that come and say, look, I, I have something that's really interesting. It doesn't only have to be for smart cities, um, but I want to test it on a living population before, uh, uh, so I understand how does it fit with India, uh, what needs to be, uh, be adapted uh, in India. So it's actually some way of supporting the, the whole uh, technology transfer, if you will, technology adaptation. And what we're doing now, after the success, after two and a half years of that lab, uh, we're now looking at four other labs in different areas of, uh, of, uh, of India, and they all have different focus areas. So one will have uh, a focus area on drones, um, one will have a focus area on, on food and agriculture uh, and, and, uh, and climate action, tourism. A third one will have specifically on, on uh, plastic uh, waste and, um, and, and, and ocean problem because it's based in, uh, in, in Goa. Um, so that way, we're hoping that we will be able to uh, accelerate the uptake of interesting technologies to deal with problems that have been defined by local communities. And I think that's that's what's um, what's uh, what's uh, what's uh, what's important. Yeah. And I, I think you know if if we have a talk again in in three or four years, uh, Dennis, I, I will hope that I can present to you this is the impact that these five labs have had, and I hope we'll have more than five labs by then. But at least we'll have. A, a clear sense of what has gone through, what has been proved as concepts and what has been implemented, what has been scaled up and what sort of impact has it had. So that's, uh, that's the driving, driving agenda and the driving motivation uh, to, uh, to, to engage in, in something like that. Well, this, this is really, I think, one of the most important things for everyone listening to us, because definitely everything that touches uh, these levels of innovation, first of all, and scalability are the biggest in the planet. I know, for instance, I heard about the, yeah. uh, for us all the 100 cities smart smart city initiative in india and the thing is the scale of india is so big we talk about 1.4 billion people that uh, of course europe the the medium class in europe is the size of whole europe and people forget that so so let, let's go a bit of the nuances of uh, the work you're doing 
both, for instance, the let's say you touch right now just the smart cities, but for instance, there's the clean um, tech, there's research and development, there's uh, uh, a lot of relationship with universities that you guys have, and there's well a fantastic team that is really very focused on looking at these things. So, from a 360 degrees, what are the areas that you feel that you are stronger and that you could highlight for people listening to us? So, I mean, clearly one area, I mean, you know, thematic is, is the um, structuring of projects that make it attractive to Europeans to, to, uh, to, to join. So I think that's where we go. We're also quite good stakeholder managers, I believe, because, I mean, our DNA is collaboration. Yeah, and it takes uh, it takes uh, it takes two to tangle. So we're definitely not yes. working any any silo. Um, and and Denise, we work with Indian government. We work with Indian. Uh, I mean, we, we are contracted by Indian government and Indian state level government to to work for them. We're contracted by Indian promoters to find European partners, find European technologies. We're contracted by by European. Uh, businesses and technology owners. We're contracted by European governments, so the EU and individual member state governments as well. Uh, so our our claim to fame is to say somehow that 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 we 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 say we know what does everybody want, what what is it that everybody's looking for, and I think that is is the unique uh, selling point, if you will, in saying this is what we can provide to you, dear company or whoever approaches us, because we know what. The other parties you will have to deal with uh, are looking for uh, to make anything work. Yeah. So, um, and 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 that was also blatantly clear in in one EU project that we did, uh, which is called the business support to the EU India policy dialogue. So obviously the EU and India have a lot of policy dialogues. So they have dialogues in clean energy, they have dialogues in climate, they have dialogues in water, in mobility, uh, and so many more things. And and the mandate of that project was to bring business into that discussion yeah so before anything is spoken or agreed upon a government level to get an understanding of okay uh, uh before we create this policy into, into regulation or law what 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 does business say yeah and, and what works for for business and how do we create a conducive environment so so that collaboration and that implementation the projects that we as government players want actually actually happens um, so that was a, a very uh, interesting, interesting project where we also uh, had to connect to 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 all the all the variety of uh, of, of stakeholders. Yeah. So um, project structuring, knowing uh, what stakeholders want, stakeholder management, and then obviously, uh, if you talk about about sectors, I mean we're quite um, true to our sectors. Yeah. We're, so I know sustainability is very broad, but what we've been very active is is energy, so clean energy. Uh, we've been very active in mobility, specifically urban mobility, um, and, um, and then also water and, and, and waste. That's where we've actually been, uh, been, been, been mostly uh, active. We've also, interestingly, been, been active in sports, uh, believe it or not. Yeah, but there's a lot of, of, of sports facilities that can be turned into uh, something a lot more sustainable and used a lot more efficiently and creating a lot more activity for communities, which we also think is, uh, is extremely uh, important. Yeah, And that way, we're actually tapping into a large pool of corporate social responsibility uh, funds that is available uh, in India. As you might know, uh, now all companies have been mandated, uh, all companies above a certain size have been mandated to spend 2% uh, of the profits on, uh, on corporate social responsibility projects. So they're also seeking for, for, for projects and, and also actually uh, uh, counterparts and, and technologies and solutions in, uh, in, in, in Europe. Yeah, and um, uh, there's a big uptake in, 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 in sports activities because that's very clear that that has a, a, has a huge community uh, impact. Yeah, so that has been an, an interesting, interesting uh, space that we've uh, we ventured into. There's a lot of stuff there and congratulations, first of all, because that's a great achievement. And I think sometimes if you see the news, you always see the, the negativity, but there's amazing things happening. So, so let let's look at a case studies. Uh, I think the case studies are really important. Uh, cool. So, so from let's look at, for instance, in in uh, energy, one case study that one to highlight, and probably on sports as well. I, I know anything that is public, of course, because I think it's really uh, this kind of things is where I think people listening to us can actually see. Okay, wow, this is cool. I never thought about it, or or actually, can I get into this? 
And I think this is normally what I like to do because that's where business starts and that's where actually awareness creates. And, and as well, yeah. sometimes you demystify a lot of things. Yeah. Okay. Let, let, let me start with, uh, with, with sports, Denise, because that's a really, really interesting one. There was uh, a, a Dutch program, in fact, um, to uh, connect, I think it was 12 or 13 uh, Dutch companies at the time, uh, to create a, um, a uh, I'm not saying mobile, but, but a small pitch. Yeah, so a, a pitch for, uh, for, for soccer. Uh, it could also be used for uh, 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 other sports, uh, but mainly, mainly, mainly for, for soccer. So what did the, the company, the companies produced, uh, uh, turf uh, produced, uh, one, another company produced the, the fencing, a uh, third company produced uh, LED lighting, uh, a fourth company produced sort of a filter system. So when it rains and that rain comes down and it, it gets filtered and, and can be used for, for drinking water. Um, uh, 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 and, and there were several other companies and elements to, to, to the pitch. It all came in a container, and the container could be unpacked and it could be opened in, in, in a park. The container then became a changing room, so a changing room for girls, a changing room for boys. It could also become a kidana shop. There were solar panels, so everything was, was autark, everything was uh, on its own, didn't have to get connected to anything. Uh, so there were lights in, in, in the evening. And the water was also spent for, for showers. Uh, two of the companies were coaching companies. So coaching uh, for, for soccer and also coaching for, for hockey. And they didn't only coach on, on the sport itself, but also coached on life skills. Yeah, so uh, kids in the community would come and play and they would be coached in the sport, but also told, hey, uh, look, you, you don't hit each other. Um, um, yeah, women, boys and girls are equal. Uh, you should not spit. Uh, please brush your teeth and here are some uh, toothbrushes and bring them home and show your parents how to brush teeth also. Um, and so there's a whole whole program around that. And, and, and that was, was also managing stakeholders, bringing everybody together uh, and putting it in place. And, and there's, a, there's a demonstration unit just put up here at, at uh, JN Stadium in, in, uh, in, in Delhi, in, um, in Defense Colony. And it is in use, I mean, from early morning to, to, uh, to, to late evening, yeah? So the idea is now that uh, uh, because that was a, a, a government program, um, that was an expensive product at the end of the day. It was all uh, manufactured in, in, in Europe, in, in Holland. It was all brought and imported to India. So the idea is now to say, let's work with Indian counterparts who can actually manufacture some of this in India at, uh, and make the whole thing a bit more uh, uh, attractive from a pricing point of view for, for India. And it's actually a wonderful project for, uh, for CSR. So say a large multinational uh, will, will say, oh, I, I will procure 25 or 30 of these uh, and I will place them in the parks, but he also needs uh, the place in the park. So EBDC as a technical uh, knowledge partner, technical handholding partner for some of the smart cities like Pune will say to Pune, hey, look, um, together, we can get the CSR money, we can create some activity, uh, some community building, some sports, keep kids off the street, keep kids healthy, uh, uh, learn them life skills and do that in your parks, but we need 25 uh, places for, for these, uh, these pitches to be in, in, in the parks. And we will manage everything around that with the, with the coaching and, and everything. And the company, uh, the city, the council could even go out and call upon, uh, what do you call it, uh, uh, large companies to say, hey, why don't you spend some of your CSR money on this? Um, and and so so that was that took two years to put all this together to demonstrate in in uh, in, uh, in 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 India. Um, we bring a lot of people to come and have a look at the, uh, uh, the, the 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 demo model. So it's proof in concept because it's uh, it's 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 running. It's being used uh, used permanently. People are excited about it, and now it goes into the practicality of actually actually uh, scaling it up. Yeah. So I think that's a wonderful example of of this whole group of, uh, of stakeholders that are, are managed, uh, convened regularly, and this is what's required, uh, also setting it up and, and creating awareness about it. Uh, and and um, yeah, so that's, uh, that's an ongoing ongoing product and it's going into, into its next phase. Yeah, and, and this similar sort of model that, that works you know, um, in energy, it, it, it works in environment, it works in, 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 in water, it works in e-mobility, I said earlier. Yeah? So, and it can work in, in so many different uh, different different sectors. So uh, it's quite quite exciting uh, to uh, to do these, especially when you see something that's done. You see the impact 
and you see the opportunity the scalability of, of, of what you've done yeah well congratulations it's really impressive and i think these areas is something that uh, i think special with the scalability of india there's amazing work being constructed there so let's go to that area right now so from an indian perspective um so we talk talk about the case studies related with uh, especially the uk and uh, and the areas that i know that we passed one hour so i'll try to be respectful to you i'll try to synthesize in one or two more questions i'm sure you have an agenda but let's look from the the side of innovation from india to europe and all the two things have been established because i think that is one thing that most of the case studies of course india is the fast growing number of unicorns in the world I mentioned the 100 cities, smart cities network. There's as well, I think, a project of 10,000 villages, infrastructure. There's a lot yeah. of projects like that. And it's all the scale is always crazy. So um, if you can tell us that, because I think it's important for us to see from an outside the great things that are happening with India. Yeah, no, no. I mean, so you're absolutely right. It's one of the biggest challenges that European company, any European company has a challenge with the scale of India. So you come and say something, uh, show something and... India will ask you, so where is this already up and running? Oh, it's in Denmark, oh, in, in a city of uh, 50,000 people. It's a really good system, India will say. We see it's working. Can you please also do it for 10 million or 50 million? And, and it doesn't matter whether it's mobility. It doesn't matter whether it's sewage. It doesn't matter whether it's power transmission. It doesn't matter. In, in any sector, the scale is what is super, super difficult for uh, for, for uh, uh, Europeans. Yeah, and And even... Even technology, uh, you know, uh, solutions that are based a lot on technology, you still have to redesign uh, for the scale that that uh, that is there in, in India. Um, uh, even though you know, venture capitalists will say, "Oh, anything that's technological is easily scalable." I mean, I I would you know put a yeah. interesting yeah. on that statement. Uh, uh, looking at looking looking at India, um, but uh, I, I think what was your question about uh, from India to to Europe? Uh, because we're yes. getting an enormous amount of, of queries from, from Indian companies who uh, I told you about the European brand in India. Everybody in India thinks, uh, uh, has a perception that, that Europe is, is this brand, Europe, Europe is great and, and has great technologies. And I think it's, it's, it's also true. And what is also uh, quite broadly known in India uh, by, with, with many companies is that what is happening in Europe is there's a huge uh, succession challenge for many small and medium-sized enterprises. So the generation that built up a business, uh, say in machinery or engineering or any any sector, logistics, yeah, uh, is now facing a challenge because his children do not want to take over the business, yeah, because that's uh, it's 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 not, I mean, it's not digital, it's not online, it's not. Uh, uh, technical, yeah. I mean, logistics is moving goods from A to B. Yeah, okay, you can uh, make a lot of uh, uh, digital elements on it, um, uh, which is also happening in, in a big way. But what they are saying is, is there anybody in Europe with that expertise? I, as an Indian company, can buy into. Can I acquire such a company? Because I, I, I would need that expertise. I would maybe want to even manufacture uh, uh, components in 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 uh, in Europe. Um, or have that logistics know-how of a, of, a, of a logistics company or, or in any, any sector. So interestingly, that's, a, uh, that's an inquiry that's coming quite, quite often to us, yeah? Now, the challenge for EBDC is we need to have a, a great network in Europe to make that happen because the core of our people are based in India, yeah? But I think that's uh, uh, what we really need to focus on as EBDC in the coming, uh, coming year or two is... Uh, to to make EBDC truly bilateral, yeah, because uh, it, it, there has been a lot of focus on Europe to India, but if our DNA is collaboration, and that's also the word that is used by a lot of politicians in the EU India uh, space, uh, then we have to be truly uh, uh, bilateral. We have to look in both ways. We have to collaborate in both ways, yeah, uh, in both directions. And I think uh, uh, India can for sure learn a lot from um, um, the research and innovation space in, in Europe. Uh, um, I think that is, is, is very uh, dynamic, very, uh, it is very well structured to get a lot of inputs from different stakeholders to make a, a product that is good. So industry doesn't uh, um, uh, do research innovation in, in isolation. There's a, there's a lot of work with academic institutions, research institutions, associations, 
uh, clusters is, is, is a big part of the innovation ecosystem in, in Europe, and that is missing in, in, uh, in, in India. And, and I think uh, if more European companies also uh, take the jump and, and come to India, maybe that will also be a push uh, for that research and innovation ecosystem to develop in, uh, in, in India and, uh, and benefit both India and, and European businesses. Yeah, I was talking about co-creation in India for a global market earlier. And I think um, uh, then with something like that, then automatically the bilateral part, the, 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 the truly bi-directional uh, uh, collaboration will, uh, will, will happen. So that, that's a great way to wrap up. And I, I think it's here. I know that we passed one hour. I want to be respectful of your time. So, so I think for people listening to us is this part of the bridge between Europe and India, which is, of course, two of, two of the biggest economies in the planet. And actually, I think fast growing India definitely is passing yeah. everything. But uh, I think this collateral uh, collaboration space that I think it's really important. So, uh, Pool, uh, for people listening, just if you can just highlight the major digital platforms and where people can find the BTC yourself as well, but at least the areas that you want to share. Um, I think it's always coming from your mouth is much easier than actually all the things writing here. But I know that a lot of people will be trying to and get more. Even me, I want to get more and definitely will be more interviews like this. But actually, we're going to join forces because I want to promote this more. Yeah, I mean, Denise, it's super easy. It's uh, it's ebtc.eu. And, and there's a lot of information there. There's also anybody, uh, uh, you know, the ability to contact anybody there. Obviously, I'm on LinkedIn. Um, not so many Paul Jensen's at, at EBDC. <laughs> so easy, easy, easy to find. Um, and, and obviously happy to, to engage on, on, on any, any platform. LinkedIn, uh, on, 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 uh, on the website. Uh, my email is also quite simple. It's Jensen, my last name, at the rate of ebdc.eu. So also uh, very simple and um, yeah. Every email, every inquiry uh, gets answered. I mean, we have a target of 24 hours. Uh, uh, doesn't always happen, I have to admit, Denise, but um, that would really no, try it's, out. <laughs> it's normal, actually. That's quite a great target, but it's not what well, important is the follow up. So it's been a truly pleasure and privilege. And I think, really, I learned a lot more about uh, all the fantastic things you guys are doing. I think we're going to highlight this in the interview. There will be a series of parts, like I mentioned. Uh, we didn't touch too much about the Prope 2021 project, but I'm, I'm going sure that you're going to do that probably. Uh, the Smart Cities was highlighted uh, and the innovation program. We touched about the clean energy and as yeah. well, especially what it means uh, EBTC, I think, for the people listening to us. Cool. Uh, I, I want to thank you for this time. It's over one hour and uh, looking forward for the next one. Definitely, I want to do a series of talks about India, Europe, because I think it's really important to make these bridges. Yeah, and uh, the next time we do it, there will have been changes in the geopolitical situation again. So we have a lot more Definitely. to talk about. <laughs> That's what makes this as well exciting. But I hope that is a bit better. But we have to be and part some of success that. stories in EU India collaboration. Yeah, that's that's Very for good. me the most important. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. Tak. Thank you, Denise. Tak. Okay. Safe travels. See you when you get here. Cheers. Thank you. Cheers.